next session is uh, by dr viraj shah he is another md pediatrics from bjmc ahmedabad he is a crisil certified wealth manager nsc certified financial planner and wealth manager he, uh, you can see him in different groups and different platforms speaking on personal finance a very passionate long term investor uh his email id and mobile number is there on the screen if somebody wants to note and i will post it in the group also dr viraj yeah am i audible yes perfectly okay should i share my screen so is it seen yes doctor okay 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 so first of all thank you very much dr vipul bai for giving a kind and generous introduction of mine uh the topic given to me today is a direct stock investing self versus guided now let me tell you that this topic is extremely complex to topic to discuss very simple very interesting so that uh, at the end of the session at least you will have some idea that if you want to directly invest into the stocks what all knowledge you should have so let me start my session now out of all the asset classes as we have seen that equity is the asset class where you can generate the highest long term wealth and over a long period of time this asset class gives you gives you the maximum return now there are two ways of investing in equities number one is direct investment and the second one is indirect investment in direct investment what you do you analyze and select the companies on your own you construct your portfolio monitor it and all the onus of getting returns or getting loss is on yourself only so if you are not knowing anything about the uh, uh, business fundamentals it is better to give your money to the either mutual fund or the portfolio management services you give them their expense ratios or the fees and they will manage your money in their own way but here we are going to discuss about direct stock investments now at the outset let me tell you that direct stock investing is not at all easy because it requires extensive time research and constant monitoring it also requires a great degree of expertise to research the stocks across sectors and track the stock movements it can be extremely risky proposition if it is done without a due diligence so second thing is that you need to have a proficiency in stock selection because the domestic equity market is having a 5000 listed stocks and selecting the right stock from this investment is a herculean task third is the brokerage cost the brokerage cost also applied when you are directly investing in the stocks and fourth is about the emotional biases which also comes into the account so direct stock investing is not at all easy and even then let us let us see that if you want to really go for it how should you do about it now let me start with the introduction of the fundamental analysis fundamental analysis is a holistic approach so when you are investing in a particular company for a long term say about a period of about 3 4 5 years you need to study that company in detail right so you should have a complete understanding about how the company how the management everything you should know and if you see historically all the consistent compounders like asian paint burger paints page industries infosys tcs these have always been the fundamentally very strong companies and you can see the returns they have generated over a long period of time so all these good companies or we can say that investable grade companies have some specific traits so you have to understand those specific traits of a strong company as well as those of the junk companies technical analysis is a knowledge which may add value to it especially when you want to enter the stock now 
fundamental analysis is divided into two parts qualitative and a quantitative one in quantitative analysis the annual report is the sole thing which you require which will be divided into other two parts one is financial statements and second is financial ratios in financial statements what you will see is income statement balance sheet and cash flow statement and in financial ratios you will see four important ratios so which are the profitability ratios leverage ratios valuation ratios and operating ratios but let me tell you that analysis of the banks and financial services stocks requires some additional financial metrics that also we will discuss later so let us directly dive into the qualitative analysis now what qualitative analysis aspect you should evaluate in a particular company number 1 is management background what is the education of a management what are the merits he is having what kind of experience he is having running the business that all you should check second very important is the business ethics and corporate governance whether this management has been involved in some of the scams briberies or any unfair business practices if that is the case it is a it is a red flag and you should never consider such companies from annual report you may read related party transactions now what are these actually when the management is giving some of the orders to the uh, uh, his relatives and he is doing some undue favor these orders may not be at the market rates and this is the best way for the corrupt management to siphon your money and ultimately what are the uh, sufferers are the retail investors so those companies who are having multiple related trans party transactions you should avoid them second thing if you find that promoter is involved in some of the operator activities so when the stock is having some undue movement and along with that the promoter is also selling or buying the stocks then you should get rid of that particular stock you can check from the annual report how much salary the promoters are drawing now this is generally mentioned as the percentage of operating profits is it high or at par if it is very high then it is not considered to be good the shareholding pattern is also a very important criteria you have to check that what is the skin in the game of the promoter if the promoter is holding say about 74 75% of the total stake then he is a skin is in his game so it is better for the company second thing you have to see the stakes of the fii's which is foreign institutional investors and if you see some of the well known names because if a some person is holding more than 1% stake in a company it is compulsory to declare those names and their stake so if you find that lakesh junjunwala or dolly khanna or ashish kacholi or some there are very good names of very good investors if you find such names in the stake, uh, shareholding patterns that is also a good sign second thing is political affiliation if the management is associated with some political parties or having some political connections the favor last as long as the political connection is there and as well as as soon as the party changes that favor goes and that particular company as uh, uh, the price may collapse also then look for the promoter's lifestyle whether having he is having a flamboyant lifestyle like vijay malia or a simple lifestyle like narayan murthy so these are the qualitative aspects of any company and let me tell you that this is very important and i will say that it is more important than the quantitative analysis but it is little difficult and little subtle also okay now let us move towards the quantitative analysis in quantitative analysis the annual report of a company is the main source of information for this kind of analysis now annual report data is published not published but it is published somewhere around say in a july or august month and it will be reflecting the total data of the last financial year till last 31st of march now where do you get this annual report you can get it either from the company website from the investor section or nse website or a bse website or those who are the shareholders will be directly sent this through their emails now what are the main contents of the annual report the first one is the vision and mission statement of the company 
wherein the management will discuss what is the mission statement of that particular company, where he will see the company going forward, say some five or 10 years from now. Second is the corporate information. The third is products overview. So what are the products companies manufacturing? Is there any view on new products launching? What is the product mix? Is it changing or not? Then they also discuss about the financial highlights, about the revenues and profits of last five to 10 years. The fourth one is very important, the management discussion and analysis. Now this part you have to read completely, in which management discusses about the company itself as well as the industry where it is working. And next is the MGT9 form, where there's a shareholding pattern. Now this shareholding pattern we already discussed. And sixth, very important, is financial statements. Now this particular thing we are going to discuss in detail because this forms a vital part of fundamental analysis. So let us directly go towards the financial statements. Now financial statements of a company includes mainly three statements. Number one is income statement, which is also called profit and loss statement. Number two is balance sheet, which shows you the assets and liabilities. Number three is cash flow statement, wherein all the uh, cash activities of the uh, company is mentioned, whether it is an inflow or the outflow. So these three are the basic statements in the company's financial statements. Now let us start with the first statement, which is called income statement or a profit and loss statement. Now this particular statement mentions about a profit and loss of a one particular period. So if it's a quarterly statement, then it will mention about the last quarter. If it's an annual report, you may find the data for the whole year. Now it starts like this. The first line, which is called the top line, mentions about the revenues. What company has earned from the sale of products plus other income. In a popular language, it is called top line. Now the second is cost of materials used, which is expenses. Now if you deduct the expenses from the revenue, what is get is gross profits. From these gross profits, if you deduct general and administrative expenses, what you get is EBITDA. Now this EBITDA word you must have heard somewhere. Now it's a very scary word. People may not know the full form of it. So let me tell you that it is nothing but earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Now from this EBITDA, we will gradually deduct all the four parts, interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Now, first we'll deduct depreciation, which is applicable to tangible items, and then amortization, which is applicable for intangibles. Now, what do you mean by tangibles? Tangible means companies, property, plants, machineries, and what is intangibles? Intangibles are copyrights, patents, some uh, uh, brand value, logo, these are the intangibles. Now, as you know that any particular uh, physical assets has their useful economic value. Now, suppose, let me tell you that one particular machine, the economic life is about five years, then every year the depreciation is taken as a 20%. So these depreciation and amortization are non-cash expenses, which is debited from the EBITDA, and what we get is PBT. No, what we get is EBIT, E-B-I-T. From EBIT, if we deduct the interest cost, now all companies take some loans. So to service those loans, they have to pay interest. So if you deduct the interest from EBIT, it comes to profit before tax, which is in popularly known as PBT. Now, after deducting all applicable taxes from the PBT, what you get is profit after tax, which is also called net profit of the company, or in popular language, it is called bottom line. Now this net profit, from this net profit, what company does, it distributes some dividends if he wishes to. So whatever is left is called retained earnings. This retained earnings goes to the reserves and surplus in the balance sheet, which we will see a little later. From this net profit, if you divide this net profit, by total number of shares outstanding, what you get is the general EPS, which is earning per share. 
But those who are reading annual reports regularly or income statement regularly must have seen that there is something called diluted EPS also. Now, what is this diluted EPS? Now, in the uh, uh, equation, say in the denominator, the total shares outstanding, if you add all the, con uh, all the convertible debentures and preferred shares, and then you divide net profit by those numbers, what you get is the diluted EPS. And these EPS is always lower than the actual EPS. So this is about the income statement, and that is for the particular period. Now let us go to the second statement, which is called the balance sheet. Now balance sheet is very important because it mentions about the total assets and total liabilities, as well as shareholders funds. Now let me tell you that there's a big difference between the income statement and balance sheet because income statement is only for a particular period, whereas the balance sheet mentions everything right from the company originated. So let us discuss all the things one by one, what all falls under the balance sheet. Now, first and foremost is the shareholders funds. Now, when the company starts, promoter comes with his own capital. And if you raise the capital through the IPO, they will issue some of the shares. Say if the company raises 10 lakh of shares at 10 rupee face value, we will raise 10 lakh of funds along with his own funds. It makes the total share capital. If you add the reserves and surplus, which comes from the income statement, as we have seen, the total value is called shareholders funds. Second is non-current liabilities. Now, what do I mean by non-current? Non-current means anything which is above 365 days or above one year is called non-current liabilities. Now, what falls under this is long-term borrowings. If companies have taken some loans for five years or 10 years, it comes under this. And if the company feels that he has to pay some of the income tax later on, it is called deferred tax liabilities. That also falls under this particular heading. Now, coming to the current liabilities. Now, current liabilities means those expenses which are expected within a year, that is less than 365 days. See if the company has taken some short-term borrowings in the form of working capital or any other short-term loans, he has to service those loans. Then there are trade payables. Then there are short-term provisions also. These all fall under the current liabilities. Now, this upper section is about the liabilities. Now, coming to the asset side. Now, assets are again divided into two parts, non-current as well as current. Non-current assets are fixed asset. When the company starts, it invests into the physical assets in the forms of property, plants, machinery, laptops, furniture. These are tangible assets, which is called fixed asset. And if company has done some investments in the form of some shares or long-term deposits, that comes under the non-current investments. Then there's the current assets also. Now, current assets are the inventories which is lying in the go-down, some of the trade receivables which company expects in the year time, cash and cash equivalents lying in the banks, and some short-term loans and the advances which company has taken. So this comes to the company, that is why it is in the asset form. So the beauty of balance sheet is that the total of the assets has to be equal to the total of the liabilities. And if you divide non-current and current assets, and you uh, like if you add non-current and current assets, and if you deduct current liabilities and the non-current liabilities, what you get is the shareholders funds. Okay, so this is all about balance sheet. Now coming to the third statement, which is called the cash flow statement. Now cash flow statement comprises of the three parts. The first is cash flow from operating activities. Now, this particular cash flow statement is extremely important, let me tell you that people generally read about profit and loss statement, but they never read about the cash flow statements. They just see that how much profit company has generated, but it is not at all important. All, all jugglers are done in cash flow statements and cash flow statements are very difficult to fudge. So uh, you cannot play mischief with the cash flow statement because these are the real figures which are reflected into the bank accounts. So it is absolutely essential for any fundamental investor to read cash flow statement very, very minutely. So cash flow statements from operating activities mention those inflows and outflows of cash, which is directly related to the core operating activities of that particular company, like sales of goods and services, advertisements, marketing, then companies giving some salaries to the uh, employees, supplier payments, income tax payment. These fall under the operating activities. 
Now, second is cash flow from investing activities. So, what are whatever income the company generates, it invests this particular cash into some of the investments. He may have, uh, he may purchase some of the property, plant, machinery, or he may invest this particular amount into the shares or the long-term deposits. So, these all goes under the investing activities. Third statement is cash flow from financing activities. That means when the company distributes the dividends, the company pays the interest on their loans, he may raise the capital by corporate bonds or issuing some of the new shares. This is all called the cash flow from financing activities. So these three are the important statements falling under the head of cash flow statement. Now, I have just shown here a one uh, photograph of a cash flow statement wherein you can see that in all the activities, there's a cash inflow as well as the cash outflow. So cash, cash flow doesn't mean that it is always an inflow. That may be an outflow also. Now, ultimately what you have to do, you have to uh, add all the three, one plus two plus three, and whatever you get here is a net change in the cash balance during that particular period. So if it is a quarterly result, it is a change in the quarter. If it is an annual result, what has happened from the previous cash balance of the previous year? So at the addition and subtraction, if the ultimately the company is having a free cash, positive cash, so company is cash rich, then it's a very good thing for that particular company. So you should always see that whether that particular company is having a positive free cash flow or not is an extremely important factor for judging a good company. Now, we have seen all the three parts of the annual report and the financial statements. But how to get the inferences from this? For that, we need to calculate some of the financial ratios. So first and foremost, financial ratio is the profitability ratio, which tells us about how profitable the company is as compared to other companies and of the same sector. The second is leverage ratios which tells us about the financial stability of that particular company. So company may go bankrupt or not that you have to uh, uh, see from these ratios. The third is the valuation ratios. It will tell you what is the valuation of that particular company, how costly that company is, and at what price you are acquiring, acquiring the company, whether it is overvalued or undervalued. And fourth is the operating ratios, which tells us how efficiently the company is managing its core operations. So let us discuss all these ratios one by one. Now, first is the profitability ratios. Let us discuss what is EBITDA margins. As we have seen what is EBITDA, this margins is, uh, the equation is like this. EBITDA is upon operating revenues into 100, means EBITDA margin is a percentage of operating revenues. Now, I, if I tell you that, Ultradex cement, he is having a EBITDA margin of 18%. Is this particular thing will be of any importance? No, because in itself, it doesn't give you any information. But if I tell you simultaneously that Ambuja cement's EBITDA margin is 15%, then you will come to know that Ultradex cement is managing his expenses very well and his EBITDA margin is higher than Ambuja cement. So it is a more profitable company and it is managing his expenses very well. So that is how you have to compare the companies from EBITDA margins, as well as if the EBITDA margins are increasing year on year or for one particular company over the last few years, that is also a very good sign. Second is PET margins, which is profit after tax as a percentage of total revenues. This is same as uh, the importance is same as that of the EBITDA margins. The third very important matrix is return on equity. Now, return on equity is nothing but the net profit, which is divided by shareholders' equity. Now, these metrics is very important, and you have to see these metrics very carefully. And I can tell you that in Indian market, if you find that return on equity is above 20% for years together, this company is said to be a very good. And these metrics is always to be considered. But there is a uh, one shortfall of this particular ratio that I'll come to now that while you are calculating the ROE, if that particular company has taken a lot of debt, then this debt is not coming into this equation. So it will be unduly showing the high ROE, even if the company is not that profitable. So the better ratio is what? ROCE, which is called return on capital employed. 
which takes into account all the equity and debt which the company has taken and all this capital how much the company is deriving its profits that is considered so roc is always a better metric than the roe okay now coming to the leverage ratios as i told you this ratio is very important regarding how efficient the company is in servicing its loans so the first and foremost and very important is debt to equity ratio which is nothing but total debt upon total equity now total debt is short term loans as well as the long term loans so you have to add both the borrowings here and total equity is shareholders funds which gives you share capital plus reserves plus surplus if you find that the debt to equity ratio is less than 1 it is considered good but some of the companies are having this ratio as zero also so these are the debt to equity these are the debt free companies so these companies are really very good now second thing is interest coverage ratio now this is nothing but the ebit upon interest payment this is again as uh, giving us the uh, indication that how uh, this company is able to uh, uh, services interest and higher the ratio it is better and the chances of this particular company going bankrupt is very less so let us come to the third ratio which is a valuation ratio valuation ratio very important and very common ratio is the pe ratio which all of you must be knowing it is nothing but the price upon earning per share now the general belief is that lesser the pe cheaper is the company and undervalued is the company and you have to go for that now is it the right thing let me tell you the answer is resounding no why because the company is cheaper because of the reason there are some problems with the company that is why the market is giving it a very low pe similarly you will find that some of the good companies which are consistent compounders for years together are trading at a premium valuations like asian paint virgil paints these companies are trading at somewhere around 80 or 90 pe but they have been trading at dp for years together and these are the long term consistent compounders because the market is seeing that these companies are very good they have a very long run to go and the management is also extremely good financial ratios are good so these companies even though they are trading at a very high pe they they are really good companies so low pe should not always be the criteria for selecting the stocks secondly we can see the price to book ratio it is nothing but the market price upon the book value now what is the book value book value is a salvage value of a company say if the tomorrow company is sold if all the assets are sold if all the debts are serviced whatever is left on the table is called a book value now this book value is generally calculated as a percentage of uh, as a as a per share value so you have to divide this book value in the form that uh, share capital plus reserves plus surpluses divided by number of outstanding shares this will give you the book value per share now price to book ratio is generally considered for the financial companies ratio and the and the banks and third is the price to sales ratio which is nothing but the market cap to total revenue that means that uh, uh, what is the total market cap upon the total revenue of that particular company if it is less than 1 it is considered to be really undervalued company so these three are the valuation ratios now the last one is the operating ratios let us see the working capital turnover ratio now this ratio is calculated like total turnover of the company that is net sales upon the working capital of the company now suppose the net sales in a one particular year is 8 crores and the working capital is 1 crore the ratio comes to 8 this means that to get the revenue of 8 rupees company spent only 1 rupee as its working working capital right so better the ratio better for the company second is inventory turnover ratio now this means that how many times the company turns over its inventory in one particular year so this is expressed as cost of goods sold in a year depending uh, uh, divided by average inventory now similarly if i told uh, if i tell you that cost of goods sold for one particular year is 8 crores and the average inventory is 1 crore 
you will get 8 what is 8 the inventory turnover turn, turnover ratio is 8 that means that company is turning over its inventory eight times in a year that means it is replenish it has to replenish its inventory every 1.5 months so higher the inventory turnover ratio better it is for the company similarly asset turnover ratio means net sales upon average total assets this again tells us that how efficiently company is generating its revenues using its assets so these are the operating ratios so friends what we have, what we have seen is that all these kind of ratios are very important in judging the company's stability its profitability its operating efficiency and leverage so from these you have to infer that whether this company is good or not and you have to compare these ratios with other companies of the same sector now as i told you that we have to analyze the financial stock in some different manner so banks and nbfcs we have to judge some with some different category of matrices so let us see that also for banks you have to consider gnpa which is called gross non performing assets now as you know that other companies are generating their revenues from their assets but for a bank what is an asset loan is an asset for a bank because bank generates all its profits from the interest which is earning from the loans now what happens to a bank if he uh, give loan to a particular person if he, that person is not giving that particular loan back as well as the interest is not giving so that particular thing is called gross npa and it is expressed as the percentage as a total advances gross advances now after some time the company feels that whatever some of the loans are not going to come back forever so what it does that it will provide some money and it will provide that money set aside that is called provisions so what is the percentage of the provisions uh, as of that of the gross npa is called provision coverage ratio if this ratio is more than 70% it is considered to be good the third is net npa if you deduct npa provisions from the gross npas it comes to net npa now coming to the net interest margin all the banks that raise their funds by deposits wherein they give interest to the investors and ultimately they use this fund for giving loan from where they earn the interest so this difference between the interest paid minus difference minus the interest earned is called net interest margin now this neem is very important some of the banks like hdfc bank are having a neem of about 3.5 to 4 and especially when the neem is low and npas are high this bank is considered to be a bad bank so you have to see all these ratios in totality next comes the capital adequacy ratio which is nothing but the total capital of the bank divided by its total credit exposure now the cr if it is more than 10 to 12% it is considered to be good for that particular bank now coming to the current account and the saving account ratio as you all know that current accounts and saving accounts the bank gives very little interest so it's a very good source of bank to raise the capital at a very low rates so the percentage of casa to the total deposits if it is less it is considered to be good and the last is return on assets which is nothing but the operating income as a percentage of total assets so these ratios are important when you are analyzing a bank as a stock now coming to the guided stock investing which is a pms like portfolio management services so pms services are strictly regulated by sebi and recently from 25 lakhs the minimum ticket size has been increased to 50 lakh the charging structure of pms is, is fixed fees or variable fees or both but ultimately what i have found out is that all in all 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 pms is generally takes around 2.5% to 3% fees as aum total asset under management so if you are investing 50 lakh rupees you end up paying about 1.5 lakh every year now let me just tell you what are the some good pmss in indian equity market saurabh mukherjee is uh, is managing a marcellus investment managers 
it has three funds consistent compounders which is a flagship fund kings of capital which is banking and financial services stocks and a small stock uh, small stocks uh, pms which is little champs this is a very good uh, pms second is mr amit jeshwani is stellion asset pms third is mr kinkas white oak capital pms and basant maheswari's pms these are some of the good pmss in the indian equity market now after the selection process what we have to do is that when we know that these are the good stocks we have to make a portfolio so portfolio management is a different subject and let me tell you the 10 commandments how you have to manage your equity portfolio the first and foremost is the diversification versus the concentration so people ask me very frequently that how many stocks should i hold in my portfolio because as you keep more number of stocks naturally your risk reduces but how many stocks are important how much diversification is required a deep study has been done for this and the conclusion is that there is no advantage of diversification if you are keeping number of stocks in your portfolio more than 20 so you should always limit your number of stocks below 20 some of the well known investors keep their stocks below 10 also which i don't advise you to do that because in such circumstances you have to allocate 10% of your corpus in one particular stock so you have to be extremely confident about the fundamentals of that particular company so don't go for that the ideal number is between 15 to 20 and in my personal portfolio also i am keeping this number so this is regarding the number of stocks you have to hold in your portfolio now coming to the second commandment which is a position sizing of your bets means that how many percentage you are allocating to one particular stock now if you are holding 15 to 20 stocks in your portfolio does it mean that you have to allocate 6 to 5 to 6% in each and every stock no not like that you have to give maximum allocation to the stock where you have the maximum conviction so when you are absolutely sure about the fundamentals and long term prospects of that particular company you have to bet big on that particular company because when this position multiplies you will get the maximum returns so it is said that size is caste baki sab bakwas now this position sizing is the single most important factor for your ultimate returns so you have to be very careful about how much percentage you are allocating to one particular stock now coming to the third commandment which is sectors now historically it has been seen that maximum wealth has been created by investing in secular growth stories now which are these number 1 is consumption and fmcg these particular companies have delivered good returns over a long term second is banking and financial services stocks which is bfsi third is information and technology stocks because these are the cash rich companies they give dividends and their management is also very good and last is the pharma companies which are evergreen so these stocks have delivered delivered good returns over a long period of time so your selection process should consider these sectors coming to the fourth commandment which is a uh, portfolio approach of core portfolio versus satellite portfolio you have to divide your portfolio into the two parts wherein your 80% allocation should go towards the consistent compounders wherein you will keep good stocks and you will keep those stocks for long term and these stocks are having extremely good fundamentals good management their earnings are very good over a long period of time here you will have to do minimum churning don't buy and sell your core portfolio you can keep 20% of allocation in the satellite portfolio wherein you can keep some cyclicals or some new entrants or some of the micro caps also so this is regarding the core portfolio versus the satellite portfolio approach now coming to the fifth commandment which is the selection process of the companies now here comes a process called qglp now here q stands for quality of business and quality of management 
G stands for growth in the earnings. L stands for longevity of the business. And P stands for the price, what you are paying for that particular business. So this is the selection process of any particular company. So first, quality of business and quality of management, we have already discussed. You have to see all other three things before investing in one particular company. Coming to the sixth commandment, which is called behavioral biases. So when you are investing yourself into the direct equity and you are managing your own portfolio, this particular thing comes into action. So there's one side, there's emotions like greed, and on the other side, there's an emotion of fear. So you are likely to be uh, taking wrong decisions at wrong times. So I have mentioned some of the behavioral biases on the right side. Let me discuss one, which is called anchoring bias. Now, suppose you have bought the stock at 100 rupees, and if the stock goes to 80, you will always wait till the stock touches 100, and then you will sell it. Now the stock doesn't know that you have bought it at rupees 80. So it may not oblige you by climbing to 100. Instead, it may go to 60, 40, 30, 10, right? So this is called an anchoring bias. So these kind of biases affects your financial behavior. You should always be cognizant about these particular biases and it can have a significant impact on your overall returns. Now coming to the seventh one, when to sell a stock. It's a million dollar question, right? Now I'll tell you there are only three conditions. Fourth condition is of course, when you need the money, you have to sell the stock. But besides that, what are the three conditions when you have to sell your position? Number one, with some thesis you have invested in one particular stock, if that particular thesis changes, then you have to sell that particular stock. Second is, if there emerges any corporate governance issue, or if the management integrity comes into the question, you immediately have to press the sell button. Don't wait. You have seen in the cases of Divan Housing, Yes Bank, Satyam, right? There are many such incidences. So in that case, even if you are at a loss, just press the sell button. Third, if you find a better opportunity in the market than one which you are already holding, then you need to, set, need to sell the stock. Coming to the eighth commandment, which is called how to monitor your portfolio. Now, this is a very important thing. And once you prepare the portfolio, you have to see quarterly results. See, all companies declare the results at the end of three months. You can check it on NSE and BSE website. Thereafter, within a day or a two, there is a management conference call, wherein you can either listen to those calls live, you can ask the questions to the management directly, or else if you want to see the recording, then you can go to this website called www.researchbytes.com. It's a very good website, which gives all management interviews in audio form, as well as the transcript. You have to watch management media interviews on TV also. They frequently come on TV. Here you may get the immediate views because you may sometimes doesn't know what is happening in the company in between the two results. So management may come in the TV and he may discuss about the uh, present happenings. Then fourth, as we have discussed, you have to read the annual report, which is very important, which is published yearly once only. And you have to set the Google alerts of those companies where you are invested. So as and when there is some new happening in that particular uh, company, then you will immediately get the Google alert. Now the ninth is, Ride your winners and without your losers. Now, this is very important because what I've seen is that people do opposite. What they do, they book profits and they hold on to their losers. So actually people are, are doing the wrong things. You have to, because uh, many, uh, um, what I've seen that very few times you are right, so whenever you're right, you have to make it big. And they say that trend is your friend until it bans. So what Warren Buffett says, that time to sell a good company is never. He's holding some of the uh, companies since last 30, 40 years in his portfolio. So let me tell you my example that I had bought uh, Bajaj Finance at rupees 130 in year 2013 before eight years. Now, as you know, recently it touched 7,500. 
and it became 58 bagger for me now had i sold this particular stock when it became two bagger or three bagger had i ever achieved this 58 bagger returns no so you have to ride your winners because the downside is temporary that is only 100% and upside is unlimited maybe it is 3000 5000 10000 percent also second thing george soros says that it is not important whether you are right or wrong but how much money you make when you are right and how much money you lose when you are wrong that matters and let me tell you my friend that there are very few occasions when you will be right and you have to make it big when you are right so at the end of 10 to 15 years if you observe your portfolio your 80% of the profits will be generated by only 20% of your stocks here also the pareto principle applies now coming to the end of my session let me reveal the top secret which is the 10th commandment and what is that it is said that wealth is created it is not earned means that you cannot generate a huge wealth just by earning it has the saving has to come you have to invest that money and the power of compounding will do the wonders over a long period of time so there are three steps to wealth creation through direct stocks number one you should have a vision to see once you have found out the company which has a very long uh, good prospects if you have deep conviction about that particular company that is the first step once you identify this particular trait of a company the next step comes is courage to now here you don't up allocate one or two percent of your total corpus you have to allocate about eight to ten percent corpus in this particular stock so you have to bet big when the odds are in your favor and third and most important thing is patience to hold now there may be many ups and downs in between but as long as the company's fundamentals are intact if company is delivering good returns year on year then you should hold on to that particular position for years together let me tell you that it is the most rewarding but very rare to find see multi baggers enters in everyone's portfolio but very few portfolios retain those multi baggers thank you very much for patient hearing and uh, thank you very much for all the participants for taking their time out and thank you very much organizers also for giving me the opportunity to present myself and let me thank my son yash also who has helped me preparing this particular ppt thank you very much take care bye bye